Yeah, let's also give it up for Prince playing piano today. Amazing job. Let's give it up for, for Ryan at the back doing media for us. Let's give it up for him. Man, we got an amazing team here at Victory Church on the Rock. And I man, Sunday has, is becoming and has been my favorite day of the week. You know, like this summer, I'm always looking forward to Sunday. Like I'm excited to be here, to be here with my family, to worship together. It's so beautiful that when we come together as a church, as a family, something shifts. Something shifts within us. Something shifts, shifts in our circumstance. Something changes. And so I'm just excited to be able to come together with you and worship together Sundays. It's amazing. And Beth and I, we're so honored to have, to have the opportunity to be the pastors here at Victory Church on the Rock. And man, my, yeah, again, my name is Dustin. I'm the lead pastor here. And we've been going through the series called I Am. We've been going through the series where we're going through the I Am statements that Jesus makes in the book of John. We've gone through several of them so far. And today we're going to continue this series. But when I was a kid, um, traveling was much different than it is now. Right, like if you want to get somewhere now, especially if you're going in your car and you don't know where you're going, what do you do? You pull out your phone. You pull out your phone and say, I need to get to McDonald's or I need to get to Calgary or I need to get to wherever it is. So you put it in your phone. It tells you exactly how long it's going to take you. It tells you if there's traffic. It tells you alternate routes. When I was younger, when we used to go on long, long road trips, what my mom would do is she would go on MapQuest. I don't know if you know what MapQuest is. She'd go on MapQuest and she would find the destination of the campground we were staying at and she would print it off and she would have a binder that she would make with all the maps, how to get to the restaurants, how to get to the campsites, how to get to the different cities. Because we used to go on seven week long road trips when I was a kid all the way through from Calgary. We drove all the way down. One time we drove into Mexico and we're pulling this tent trailer and there's guys trying to guide us and like take us to the market, but we, he's on a bicycle. We have a van and a tent trailer. We can't get to where we're supposed to go. The guy keeps coming back. Why aren't you following us? Like we used to go on long trips. And again, we didn't have phones. Like if the campground that, that we had booked somehow wasn't open, what do you do? Things, things have changed drastically now. Well, and even before this, you used to have something called a map. Right? Where if you don't know what a map is, it might blow your mind. A map, you open it, and you're supposed to be able to read it. And it's going to tell you what roads are called. It's going to tell you where things are. It's going to tell you where boulevards are. It's going to tell you where to go. Now, <laughs> I'm so bad at directions. I've said this, but I feel like, like, I'm probably worse than I should be because, like, I use a GPS for everything. Like, and these are places I've gone before. Like, I'm telling you, I know where I'm going. I still put a GPS just in case. Because when I don't, I'm like, oh, it's for sure right here. I turn right. I'm like, oh, boy. The avenues are supposed to start getting lower <laughs> where I'm headed. And they're getting higher. <laughs> I made a wrong turn, right? But can, can you imagine with me? Imagine with you, you're going on vacation with your family going to Los Angeles. You're going to be going to Disneyland. You're going to be going to Venice Beach. You're going to be going to Hollywood Boulevard, and you're so excited about it. And so you get on the flight. You fly with your family. You get into, uh, you go, you rent your car. You get into your car, and you realize that the only map you have is a map for Paris. I'm telling you, if all you have, if you're in Los Angeles and all you have is a map for Paris, you ain't getting anywhere you want to go. You're not, you're not getting to the right location, right? You're opening your map like, okay, I want to get to Hollywood Boulevard and everything's in French. It's like, I don't, I don't understand French. We're in a bilingual country and we don't understand the other language. But one time, my, Beth and I, we were driving Quebec City in, in, in Quebec. And I was driving a standard car, which I had not driven a standard car in like four years. And it's pouring rain. Like I'm telling you, like the storms we had yesterday like that, but it's pitch black. And I'm driving a standard car, and if you've ever been to Quebec City, it's very old. Like, the roads are very old. The, the, like, they're very narrow. Like, it's hard to drive there. And I'm in a standard car, and there's this hill. So I, I'm like, okay, it's right here. So I turn right, go down the hill. Not where I'm supposed to go. And I'm like, okay. I don't know where I'm going. I'm in the middle of the hill. It's pouring rain. I can't see anything. I'm in a standard car. And now I have to reverse up a narrow road in the pitch black while it's pouring rain. And I'm like, and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to read the signs. It's all French. I can't read the signs. I, I don't know where I'm supposed to park. I don't know where I'm supposed to go. But this is the way that a lot of us are going through life. 
we, 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 have, we feel like we're living here on earth and we have a road map for Mars. Like we, we are so confused on where we're supposed to go. We feel like we've just landed in a brand new city and we don't know where we're going. And the map that we're reading is not going to help us. Because we're reading the wrong map. We're actually going the wrong direction because we don't have the right map. We don't actually know the way that we are supposed to be going. We actually don't know because we're reading the wrong map. And this is, where, again, where a lot of us, I think, we find ourselves. We feel like we're just grinding through life and we don't know where we're going. We actually don't know where we're going. And this next I am statement that Jesus makes is this incredible statement as all of them are. And it's John 14, verse 6. And this is what it says. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so we're just going to go through those three statements he makes. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So the first one here is this thought, I am the way. The way, right? Super simple. I am the way. And this, this, this statement comes from a question that the disciples ask. You know, Thomas is sitting there, and they're having this conversation. They're talking about the way. And this is what Thomas asks in John 14, verse 5. He says this, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? How can we know where you're going? You have not told us the destination. I don't have an address to put in my GPS. Like, we don't know where we're going. We don't know where you are going. And Jesus responds and says, I am the way. I think a lot of us were looking for direction when Jesus is just saying, I am the way. I am actually the way. Wherever you want to go, follow me. I will take you to those places. I will take you to the places that you desire in your heart. I will take you there if you follow me. Jesus doesn't often give us the destination. He doesn't often give us the where we're going to end up. He says, follow me. He says, do you trust me enough to follow me even if you can't see? Even if, even if it's pouring rain, even if it's pitch black, will you follow me? I am the way. We don't, we're looking for the address and Jesus is saying, follow me. Trust me. I will take you to where you want to go because the world, it teaches us that there are many roads to get to God. The world teaches us there's many roads to get to heaven. That's what the world teaches us. And Jesus is saying, you guys need to listen to me. There's only one way. There's only one way, and I am the way. He says, stop trying to pursue all these other things because they will leave you lost and broken. He's saying, follow me. I am the way. And some of us were lost because we're reading the wrong map. We're, 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 we're in a different city and we can't read the map because it's for something else. It's not going to lead us to where we want to go because Jesus is saying, I am the way. Because we think we have it all figured out. Right? We, we, think that, we think that, okay, if I can get this degree, if I can only get this job at this company, if I can only start a family, if I can only do this, if I can only do that, then I'll know. And Jesus is saying, those things are all fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you actually want to start living life, if you want to start actually getting to your destination, you have to realize, I am the only way. Your job is not the way. Your career, your education, your family is not the way. Jesus is the way. That's what he's saying. I am the way. And once we find Jesus, we find the way because Jesus is the way. Jesus will guide you because, again, we might not know the destination. We not, might not know where we're going. We might not know the address of where we're going, but we need to follow him despite it. And there's this beautiful verse, Psalm 119, verse 105. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your word is a light to my feet. You know, if we're looking to actually start to see, if we want to stop feeling like we can't see anything, we need to start understanding what Jesus is saying. We need to start understanding what the Bible is teaching us. To actually be reading it. To be spending time in it. Uh, the series, I've been talking about this a lot because it's so vital to actually spend time in the Word. Because this is the only light we have. 
This is the only way that we'll know where we're going is if we actually have a light to our feet. And it says, your word is that light. He will guide you even if we don't know where we're going. Even if we can't see anything, he will put a light to our feet and all we have to do is walk in trust. Just trust. And trust is so hard. Because we barely trust ourselves. And we think, I can do it. I don't even know if I can do it, but I'm the only person I can trust, so I'm just going to try and do it on my own. And Jesus is saying, you got to trust me. What I have for you is so much better. What I have for you is so much bigger. If only you follow me because I am the way. <coughs> he will guide you if we trust him because we need to realize he will always deliver us from evil. He always will protect you. He always will be guiding you. He always will be leading you. He will always be loving you. He will always be forgiving you. He will always be taking care of you. He's always sitting there saying, it's going to be okay. Even though the evil surrounds us, we will never be. Uh, he will always deliver us <coughs> from it. No one gets to the Father except through me. Number two, so number one, the way. Number two, the truth. I think after this past couple years we've had, I think we are sick of opinion. I think we are. I think we're getting to a point where we're sick of our own opinion. Right? Like, I think some of us were so sick of looking at our life and be like, I, I have the best answer. Because I think we're realizing nobody has the best answer. We're looking for truth. And some of us, where we find our truth is the wrong source. I'm telling you, Facebook is not the greatest source of truth. I, I, have, I have friends who post on Facebook and, and they, they're convinced they have the answer. I'm like... You don't. I don't post that to them because I don't want to be rude. But we think we know truth. And the disciples, right? We don't know where we're going. Jesus is saying, okay, I'm the way. But I'm also the truth. You want truth? We need to stop reading Facebook and we need to start reading God's book. Like I'm telling you, if we're, the source is so important. I don't know if you guys know what Babylon B is. You've ever read Babylon B? It's like sat, sat, sati, satirical. Is that the word? Sat, satire. And some people think it's true. And, and there's a story. This pastor, he was on there, and, and it said he was getting traded to a different church, like sports. And he got like DMs being like, hey, what is happening? And he's like, bro, look at the source. This is not the right source. And if we're going to the world for the source, we're going to be left being so confused. If we're going to doctors for the source, we're going to be confused. If we're going to politicians for the source, we're going to be confused. We need to go to God for the source. Because Jesus says, I am the truth. Stop looking at everything else. He says, you might not even understand it. There's some truths we will never understand. We, we don't even understand how they're true, but we just say, God, I trust you. This is the truth. I will walk in it. He says, I'm the way, the truth. I am the truth. Truth is Jesus. You know, the truth is a person, not a concept. We look at it as a concept. That's when we get confused because everyone has a truth. Everyone has something they believe that they believe 100% is true, but then somebody else believes that everything they believe is 100% untrue. And we're like, I'm so confused. And Jesus is saying, you don't need to be confused. I'm truth. That's who I am. It's not just a concept. It's an actual person, Jesus. You know, John 8, 31. He says this just a few chapters earlier. He says this, John 8, 31, verse 32. Very used verse, very taken out of context. It says this, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my, in my word, you are truly my disciples. And this verse taken out of context, and the, you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 
So what we've done is we've taken that and said, okay, my truth will set me free. And Jesus, is, we read the first part, it says, abide in me, then you will know the truth, and then the truth will set you free. So where we're finding our truth really matters. Where we're actually finding truth for our lives and for ourselves and for our family, for our city, for our country, matters. The source is very important. He's saying, if you abide in me, and abide means to accept or to act in accordance of, right? So, so are we acting in accordance to Jesus and his teachings? Are we accepting Jesus for who he says he is? Are we doing that? Are we actually abiding in his word? Are we saying, God, I don't understand this. And I'm telling you, it's okay to not understand. I think for a long time we've been taught in church that we just need to understand it and just believe it, which is awesome. I think that's great. But sometimes we don't understand. Sometimes we read a scripture and say, I don't get this. And Jesus is saying this, are you going to act in accordance to what I say? Are you abiding in me? Because once you abide in me, then freedom comes. Freedom doesn't come when we abide in our politicians, when we abide in our, in our pastors, in our family. He says, truth will set you free when you abide in me. Because I am the truth. I am the truth. Do we base, base our truth off, truth off of our experience or do we base our truth based off of him? Do we look for truth in how we feel or do we look for truth in who he says we are? Who, where are we finding truth? Do we go to Jesus first? Do we go to scripture first? Or do we go to Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest first? Because where we go first really tells us where we are. If you're looking for truth, look for Jesus first. Then you will find truth. Read the scripture. Spend time with him. He needs to be the source of truth in our life. Because once we abide in Jesus and walk in accordance to his teachings, then we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. Not all truth sets you free. Sometimes truth holds you captive. It actually holds us captive. Because Jesus is truth and Jesus will set you free. The world will not set you free. Family won't set you free. Jesus will set you free. So let's abide in Jesus and not in our politicians, not in our athletes, not in our pastors, but in Jesus because he is truth. Number three, this is it, the life. The way, the truth, the life. You know, I think every human being is trying to live the good life. I think we are, right? Like naturally, we want to be successful, right? We want to have a good job. We want to have a good family. We want to have kids that never do what we ask them not to do. We want, we, want, we want the good life. We want to win the lottery. I think this is why the lottery is such a big deal is because we just want to get, we just want everything right now. We want to be living a good life. We look at our current situation and we see hope in something else. And we say, okay, I'm going to go after that. Even though the chances are low, maybe, just maybe I can find the life I'm looking for. Maybe, just maybe, I can find the freedom that I'm looking for. Maybe I can finally get out of debt. Maybe. We're all looking for the good life. And, you know, Adam and Eve, we go back to the beginning of time. They were living the greatest life. No shame. No guilt. Just love. In the garden, there's walking with the Father, picking oranges off of trees. They're living the life. But then what happens? They want more. Right? They, they want more. And so they, they, they do what they're not supposed to do, and then that gets taken away. And I think as humans, we're trying to get back to that, but we're trying to get back to the life that we're created for by going to the wrong place. We're looking for the fruit. But the fruit we're looking for is not the fruit that will set us free. It's the fruit that will hold us captive. Money will hold you captive if you let it. If you love it. Now, I like money. Money's great, you know. I eat, pay bills, travel. But we cannot let that hold us captive because then we're not actually living. All we're doing is we're actually just waiting to die. 
You know, we can be alive, but not actually living. I think a lot of us, this is how we feel. We just feel like every day we get up, and we're just like, okay, this is what I do. Do my thing, go home, go to sleep, and we just repeat. And Jesus is saying, hey, I have so much for you. Like, like, like I am life. I am life. And it's so interesting when we look at some of the world's wealthiest people are also some of the world's most depressed people. The world's wealthiest people are sometimes the world's unhappiest people. It's because I think they've gotten to a point where they've had what the world is looking for and they realize life doesn't exist there. Well, they finally got hold of what they were desperately trying for. They finally got the fruit and realized, this isn't even what I want. What I want is life. What I want is relationship. You look at Hollywood, the amount of, amount of these famous, very wealthy people that get divorced and separated and broken marriages, broken relationships, that they won't work with certain people because it's broken, it's, it's astronomically high. And I think for us, we, we need to realize that no money is going to bring you life. The house, the car is not going to bring you life. What's going to bring you life is relationship with Jesus. That's it. Like we can strive our whole life for something. We can strive and strive and strive. When you strive, it's going to leave you tired. But when you serve, it's going to leave you energy, uh, give you energy. To serve and say, you know what, Jesus, I'm following you. I've given you my life. I'm serving you now. Rather than striving for life, we're serving for life. I think it's such an odd concept, right? Because we feel like we have to just grind through and, and, and work really hard, which is great. Like, please, work hard. But if that's all you do is work hard, you're going to get to the end and realize, I missed out. You know, they, they asked people, uh, they were getting ready to die. They asked them. What's, what's one regret? They're like, I, re I regret not spending more time with my family. I regret, like, th they never regret, they, re they regret the money, they regret it all. They say, you know what, the only thing I wish I had more time was with my family. The only thing I wish I, I could do was spend more time with people. And I think it's beautiful because Jesus says, hey, I've created you for a relationship with each other. I love you. That's what life does. And it's interesting here in Matthew 16, verse 25, says this, for whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever works really hard for life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And it's such an odd concept. Because we feel like freedom comes when we strive for something. And Jesus is saying, no. Freedom comes when you lay down your life and you serve me. You want life? He's saying, serve me. You want life? Give me your life and I will bring you what I have created you for. That's what life is. If our life is found in Jesus, we need to let go of everything else. Anything else that's getting in the way of relationship with him. Jesus is the life that you're looking for. Jesus will bring you adventure. Jesus will bring you love. He'll bring you peace. He'll bring you courage. He'll bring you prosperity. And not prosperity in the sense of having all this money, but prosperity of saying, I have relationships. I have people who care about me. I have people who love me for who I am. And I think that's the beauty of the church. And I think the church is the most prosperous place, not because of money, but because of relationship. You know, church, it's an honor that we have the opportunity to come here on Sundays. It really is. Like, it's not, I don't think it's something we should take for granted. There's so many places around this world where this is not possible. And I look at this past year, and this type of meeting was not possible. And I look at it now, and I say, man, God, I'm grateful. That what the enemy tried to turn for evil, what the enemy tried to do during COVID, I look now and I say, God, you are still good. We're still here. The church is not dead. The church is thriving. 
that's what I'm excited about. And you know, invite uh, the team up, the piano player up here, Prince up. But for me, giving Jesus my life was the greatest decision I've ever made. You know, some people might say, oh, the greatest decision you ever made was marrying Beth. Great decision. Like, I don't, I'm grateful for it. But that's not the best decision I ever made. The best decision I ever made was not to become a pastor. It wasn't to buy a car. It wasn't to buy my house. The greatest decision I ever made was to give Jesus my life. It really was. And I know, like, some people, maybe you're watching, you're, you're still trying to figure this out. Do, do I believe? Do do I really want to give Jesus my life? Do, do I want to do this? It doesn't make sense, right? How can the greatest decision that you made giving Jesus your life? The greatest decision I ever made was getting a good job, providing for my family. And again, those are awesome. Like, that's beautiful. But the greatest decision I ever made was saying, Jesus, I don't want to go through life alone anymore. By saying, Jesus, I'm lost. Like, I don't know the way that... Thomas, he says, I don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And he says, I'm the way. And the greatest decision that I think we can make as human beings is to say, Jesus, I give you my life. I think that's the greatest decision that any of us could ever made, could ever make. You know, what Jesus offers us is not a life it is a life that is not that is full not a life that is easy right he offers us a life that's full but there's nowhere in the bible where it says it's going to be easy for you you know he 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 offers he doesn't he doesn't promise all our problems to go away he promises peace in the midst of our problem he says remember when you went through problems by yourself that sucked but now i'm with you i'm with you in your problem I'm with you in the most painful moment. You're not alone anymore. I'm with you. And I will protect you. I will take care of you. He will guide you and he will lead you. You know, we've been doing takeaways every Sunday this summer. and Something to remember, something to think about this week. And this is the takeaway today. It says this. It says, Jesus is the way to heaven, the truth in this world, and the life you're looking for. That's who he is. Again, this isn't just a concept, right? We, we don't come here and we don't just worship a concept, right? We worship Jesus here. We don't just come here because, you know, it makes us feel good. We come here because we've dedicated our lives to something bigger than ourselves. We've dedicated our lives to something more beautiful than anything we could create on our own. We, we've dedicated our lives to something so much bigger than us. We come here because we're looking for something to live for. And I think for some of us, we're looking for something to die for. We're looking for purpose. And Jesus is the way to heaven, the truth in this world, and the life that you're looking for. You know, before we're going to be doing communion, and if you, uh, if you need communion, you, you haven't grabbed your, your juice and your, uh, your bread, uh, I think at the back there we have some. Maybe Tia will, will give it to you. If you need some, you can feel free to go to the back. But before we go into communion I want to give an opportunity for those of us in this room or maybe you're watching online to make that decision to say Jesus I give you my life again this is the greatest decision any of us can ever make and I know again the concept is odd but the simple prayer Jesus I give you my life you know, we, I think sometimes we, we think we have to come to Jesus perfect we, we feel like we have to you know, confess everything and He's just saying, no, just come to me. If you're weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Jesus, I give you my life. He's not expecting perfection. He's just expecting you to be present. And so right now, if you want to make that decision, I'm going to ask everyone in this place, close your eyes, bow your heads. If you're at home, keep your eyes open. But if you want to say this, this prayer again, maybe you prayed it today for the first time. Jesus, I give you my life. I just want to encourage you to just put up your hand where you're at, and I would love to pray with you. Or if you're watching online, I see hand there. Yeah, if you, if you want to, if you're on the line, it's right down in the chat where I said, Jesus, I give you my life. So Father, I'm just going to pray for my friends here who gave their lives to you because, God, we celebrate today the most beautiful decision that could ever be made. God, I pray for our friends today who gave you their life today. God, we just pray that you meet them right now. You meet them wherever they're at. God, you meet them in their circumstance. You meet them in their fear. You meet them in their, wherever they are. God, I thank you that today we celebrate the fact that they gave you their life. 
Jesus' name. Amen. You know, right now we're going to uh, share in communion together. Maybe you're new to church. You're like, I don't know, really know what communion is. Communion is an opportunity for us to reflect. To reflect on what Jesus has done in our lives. What Jesus has done. What he did all those years ago on the cross. An opportunity for us to say, you know what? Thank you. It's a simple opportunity for us to say thank you. And then in the Bible here, in Luke chapter 22, verse 19, it says this, and he took bread, and this is Jesus. He says, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them. And by them, it's the disciples, right? Jesus is giving his disciples this bread, and he breaks it. And he says this interesting statement. He says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You know, today we remember Jesus, the one who is the way, the one who is the truth, the one who is the life. We remember him. We say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for, this, for, for, for your body being broken for us. Thank you for being the final sacrifice needed for us to be free. Thank you. Now, I don't know where you're at in your faith journey. I don't even know where you're at today. I don't know how hard this week was for you. I don't know how hard this weekend was for you. I don't know how hard this day has been for you. I don't know. I think all of us are walking through something. Some fear. Some anger. Some resentment. Some unforgiveness. And today... My prayer for us is just to bring that to Jesus. Again, we might not understand. Like, we might not get it. Like, why is this happening? I don't, I don't get it. But today, I want to encourage all of us to say, God, Jesus, I'm giving it to you. I'm giving you my fear. I'm giving you my, my weakness. I'm saying, God, I need you. So as we eat this bread, I want to encourage you to just think about the sacrifice that Jesus made as well as take that step of saying, God, I, I trust you again. I trust you with this circumstance. I trust, trust you with this situation. So let's partake of the bread. then at this meal he you know he gives his disciples his bread and then in verse 20 it says this and likewise the cup after they had eaten saying this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood you know this this cup i think right now for us represents refreshing some of us we are so tired our energy is so low we're just sitting here and we we, we don't even honestly know if we can go another day and I believe that right now as we partake of this cup this juice that God is refreshing you God is restoring you. God is replenishing you. Because the blood of Jesus brings rest for our soul. All shame is gone. Shame can't exist in a place where Jesus is present. So I believe that as we partake of this, the new covenant, Jesus saying, I love you. I'm going to refresh you. I'm going to replenish you. I'm going to take care of you. I know the circumstance is challenging. I know it's hard. I know there's fear. I know there's doubt. And I just want to encourage you that as we drink this cup, 
I believe that God wants to wash over us. I'm gonna invite our worship team up. They're gonna lead us in a song right after this. And this song is beautiful. It's a song that we've been singing as a church for years. It's called The Blessing. And it's just this, this amazing verse that they're singing straight scripture. This blessing that, that God is pouring out over us and over our family. I know there's a lot of brokenness in family, so I believe that today God wants to refresh you and replenish you. So let's partake of the juice. Father, I pray for all of us right now. God, I pray that you refresh us. God, I pray you bring us energy. God, I pray you bring us peace. God, I pray you bring us courage. God, I pray you bring us joy. God, I pray you bring us what our soul is needing. We pray for rest. God, right now we pray for unity within our families. We pray for peace within our families. We pray for our children who have ran away. God, I pray that you just bring them back. God, I pray that our church, Victory Church on the Rock, God, I pray that we are a beacon in our city. God, I pray that all of us, yeah, we have stuff going on. We're, we're a lot of us, we're broken, we're hurting, there's pain. But I pray that people look at us and they say, how are they so joyful? God, I pray that they look at us and they say, where do you find the courage to go through all this stuff? And we can look to, to them and God, we can say, it's you. It's you. In Jesus' name, amen. So our team's gonna lead us in this last song. And I wanna encourage you, if you wanna stand, you stand. If you wanna sit, sit. Whatever you need to do in this moment, I want to encourage you to do it. So let's sing this song with our team. Oh.